Good evening, everyone. I'm Hillary Martin Lay, and it is my pleasure to welcome you to the first in Greenwich Library's signature series this program year. The signature series offers dynamic, exceptional public programming that engages the Greenwich community and region, featuring nationally recognized experts for timely analysis and conversations that promote a lively exchange of ideas. This series is made possible through the support of the Greenwich Library Board of Trustees and contributions from generous donors. The library has asked me to re remind you to please silence your cell phone and refrain from taking any photographs during this event. We have two very special guests tonight who will help us delve into the fascinating world of art and auctions, John Hayes and Paige Knox. John Hayes, the deputy chairman of Christie's is considered the premier auctioneer of Americana sales. He has presided over such landmark events as the 1989 sale of the Nicholas Brown desk and bookcase, a $12.1 million result that remains the world auction record for American furniture. And the 2006 sale of the highest selling single owner collection of Americana, property from the collection of Mrs. J. Inslee Blair, which netted $32 million. John has spent much of his professional career at Christie's, which he joined in 1983, and where he founded the folk art department. You may recognize him as a featured appraiser on reruns of PBS's Antiques Roadshow and his signature bow tie. Greenwich resident Paige Knox is an adjunct professor in the art history department of Columbia University. She also teaches and gives public gallery talks and lectures at the Met and beyond. Paige has spoken several times here at the library, always to enthusiastic acclaim. Please join me in welcoming John Hayes and Paige Knox. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. That was a very lovely and kind introduction, and we're thrilled to have all of you here. Um, again, today is the first day of fall, so it's a great way to kick off the season. Uh, we were trying to come up with a topic uh, that we could discuss. I'm really here just to kind of let our main speaker shine and give you his ideas, but I had some things on my own mind and we decided that they were things that might be on your minds as well. So um, tonight we're gonna to be talking about the state of American art in the world, in the auction world, in the museum world, in the art world at large. And as I said, I'm very honored to be here with John. I was telling John, everyone I, I talked to, I told them I was speaking with John, they said, oh, we love, he's the nicest guy. <laughs> and to have survived and been still people saying that about you after 40 years in the auction world is really a, an incredible feat. Um, so what, what I thought I would do is I had just some questions that, that I'm just going to sort of throw out to John. We're going to talk for about 45 minutes, and then we're going to open the floor to you all um, to please share any of your questions with, with, with John as well. Uh, but I wanted to just start off to let John, I think, as I said, he's quite beloved everywhere he goes, everybody knows him, but maybe for some of you who don't know him, that he might, you might tell us a little bit about your connections to Greenwich. Well, it's a great pleasure to be here and thank you, Paige. Um, so I did grow up in Greenwich and uh, every time I drive by the Greenwich library, it seems to get bigger and bigger and <laughs> slicker and slicker. And, but back in the day, um, this is the 1970s. My dad, uh, if you can believe this, the big thing in the Hayes family was to come down to the Greenwich Library and watch old French movies, black and white movies here. And I kid you not, it was like the highlight. I was like, oh my God, this great old, you know, 1938 <laughs> movie, you know, in, in French, in black and white. And, and so the world has changed. But 
but uh, I went to Greenwich Country Day School and and uh, then went off to uh, Phillips Exeter and and um, my mom is still alive and well and um, and lives uh, on the in the same house uh, that she's been in for sixty five years on off Stanwich Road, ninety six years old. Um, could not be here tonight, but um, so I, I that's my quick bio of my Greenwich uh, love and certainly the love for the Greenwich Library, which is really an old home for me. Yeah, I feel that way too. I spent a lot of time here studying for my GREs. Uh, <laughs> I don't have pleasant memories of that part of the library, but I also will say they have a phenomenal art history collection. It really, when I need books during COVID, it was an absolute godsend for me. So now how did you go from from from, from Greenwich to Christie's? How Tell me how you got there. Well, honestly, um, when I graduated from uh, college with uh, a degree in art history, I went abroad and did another uh, degree uh, with Christie's uh, in their um, program. And I arrived back in Greenwich in 1983 without a job uh, and really with no real connections in the art world. Um, my dad was a physician and uh, not really connected to the art world, but I really wanted to give it a, a shot. And so um, I applied for a job uh, at Christie's. And of course, like everybody else, I wanted to be in the thick of it in the contemporary art department. Um, but they assigned me to the American furniture department, which I, 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 I thought was the end of the world. <laughs> <laughs> and boy, was I wrong. It, it, it was a perfect match for somebody who, uh, like me, who who um, really wasn't going to be flying around uh, Europe, uh, dropping into people's uh, homes. And um, my French is famous for being poor, uh, uh, and uh, or Germany or you know uh, another country. Um, uh, American art was a perfect fit for me because I love American history. Um, I'm I'm almost jingoistic about my 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 love of America, and what better way to do it than through American paintings and American furniture? So so sometimes as I look back on my career, um, it all makes perfect sense. It all it it really is a um, uh, a fascination that all of us have with how lucky we all are to be Americans and how lucky it is that uh, America was born and existed. And I get to go around the country and look at uh, tangible evidence of, of that great uh, country, a, a country that's, you know, we've only been on these shores for, you know, less than 300 years, basically. And most of my colleagues are dealing with things that are thousands of years old, you know, the Chinese sales are going on right now as we speak uh, in New York. There's a culture that's 5,000 years old. So relatively new, but the greatest, the greatest uh, experiment in, in, in history, America. So for me, um, I just never skipped a beat. And the art market, and we'll probably talk a bit about it, is, is the best platform for that to um, uh, project itself, I think. Right. So, so you've been there almost forty years, I which is quite exceptional, particularly in today's age, where my children are like, "Well, I've been at this job for two years. It's time to leave." <laughs> you know, I've been there too long. Um, but I, I, I think, particularly from my perspective, which I'm just going to share in a moment, but the American art world has changed dramatically, as has the auction world. So of all the things that, you know, when you look back to when you started, what do you think has been the most positive change in that um, 40 years? That's a very general question, kind of a hard question, but. No, that's a fair question because when I joined uh, Christie's, it was run by a group of uh, old British men who, um, fascinated me. They had all been in the war, the Second World War. Um, I was struck by how much trust they gave me at such a young age to, to you know, fly around and, 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 and do deals. 
and um, I, I, I love them. They were, they were quite extraordinary. The art market was um, a very small little club, though, and I think it's fair to say that that uh, one of the reasons for these enormous prices and uh, headlines that you read today was the expansion of that small little clubby world um, as it the art market embraced the entire world and people who had been outside of that club began to participate in it. And so you did not have to be born with a jato over your over your bed or a, or be the son of an earl or a duke or you you all of a sudden um, the appeal of art was not just a scholarly endeavor. Your your uh, your background is scholarship, so I I, I we, it underpins the art market. But most people don't have their PhDs in art history. Yeah, and most that's why they are. Most people are making a lot more money than I am. So. <laughs> most people don't. You know, they. It, it was something I think people were embarrassed about. You know, they may not know. You know, the the mythology or the um, iconography of 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 art, and so all of a sudden, and and we see this continuum increase to today where where the internet now has just transformed the entire uh, market so that it's embracing the entire world. Obviously um, it's expensive. So there is that economic uh, you know, cutoff, but, but the art world now is much broader than it was. So I would, I would, I would say that's one major difference. Mm -hmm. I, I, in many ways, as we tackle, I'm sure some subjects that you have, and I've, um, we've talked a little bit about it, um, where we are today as a society and where we are uh, as a working uh, you know, person in the world. I'm, I think I probably had advantages as a, as a, a white male you know, in, in, you know, in, under that kind of British you know, umbrella. Um, they, a lot of things have changed you know, from that period, but I do feel that that um, in a very strange way, some of those uh, old British guys who one of them still had a Spitfire, you know, in his in his uh, backyard um, that he had flown. Um, there's a, it's a good, healthy debate that's going on today about you know access, uh, both for the artists right. and for the employees of the art world. Uh, it's better today. Um, it's made great strides, mm -hmm. but um, that that small little art auction house that I joined, which I think the sales were $700 million worldwide um, in, in the, uh, 1983. Wow. And uh, we are, will be probably over $8 billion this year yeah. in sales. And this fall we are selling uh, Paul Allen's collection, who's co single, his, just his collection will be over a billion right. dollars. I was wondering, can you can you give us some tidbits, or is that top secret? It's not top secret because it's now it was top secret for a long time. Right. Paul Allen, the business partner of Bill Gates, passed away um, a year ago, and he was um, a bachelor who um, collected art and had the means to buy over the last thirty years anything he wanted, basically at the top of the market, unless Bill wanted it. Mm -hmm. um, and um, I guess Bill got the Leonardo and he got the Botticelli. Is that it, how they? It, it's yeah. kind of the way it <laughs> shook out. Uh, and they um, um, they both are very different people. Uh, Bill is somebody who who is very articulate. Many people in the room here may have heard him speak about during COVID um, about what his foundation is doing for access to to healthcare. Right. Um, and he's so articulate, I think, about that subject. Um, Paul Allen was a more um, inward person mm -hmm. um, and um, um, did his own thing. And but he put together a, an astonishing, an astonishing collection. And it will be sold in November, following uh, Gordon Getty's uh, art collection in October. Right. So Christie's has just been so lucky. To, over the over over the course of uh, well in the last two years 
has has just been at the front uh, of, right. of selling these collections. I wanted to ask you about that auction because from what I gather, the proceeds are going to charity. Yes. And I gather that was a model maybe established in the Rockefeller sale or the Rockefeller sale was the strong example of that. But it's surprised, I guess maybe given my affiliation with the Met, um, the idea of just giving the paintings to the museum is no longer as desirable as it raising money and then giving that money to the museum. Is that is that the decision of the collector? Is that a tax decision? Is the, do the auction houses push? So you use the word giving, that's the important word. Um, the giving pledge that Bill Gates uh, really was the, uh, uh, the, the, the catalyst for that with um, a, a community of uh, Warren Buffett and others to give half of their wealth to charity. And Paul Allen signed that pledge, as has Bill Gates. So as did David Rockefeller. Mm -hmm. So the, the Rockefeller sale um, was an extraordinary uh, event because the institutions like MoMA um, received $300 million from the Rockefeller's uh, sale um, alone. So it was transformative in, in that sense. And the sale, which was, I'm, I'm still exhausted to even, you know, kind of even say the Rockefeller sale because it was, it was. Well, the China room alone <laughs> with that China Christmas tree. Yeah. I, 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 I just, and, and that was, you know, not, I mean, it was just an incredible. Paige is referring to the, the um, exhibition, which was um, one of the most extraordinary. It was exhibits. fantastic. They, they, and, but it, but. To go to your question, I think since all of Paul Allen's proceeds of the sale will go to charity, um, I don't, I've had this debate with people. I don't think people um, are going to pay more money for the works of art because it's going to charity. I think collectors tend to look at something and say, ah, I want that or I don't want that. And that will not be based on where the proceeds are going. However, um, the proceeds are going, if you Google or you go online to paulallen.com, you will see the charities that he favors. Right. And it's extraordinary what, 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 he, what, what he has accomplished through these charities. And so it's not just a feel good thing. It is actually a tangible evidence of, of, of what um, someone with that kind of wealth can, can, uh, can do for the country and the world. Uh, so there's no debate about that. Right. It, and um, the I hope everybody can, comes into New York. The sale, I th um, it is in, uh, the, I think, the second week of November. You can see it online. But um, come in. The, the works range from Turner, uh, Botticelli to Turner to uh, contemporary artists. And they are A+. Plus, I uh, can't wait to see it. It's really interesting when they had the Rockefeller sale. Um, I was at the Met working with Christie's and we were taking potential buyers of that sale through the Lehman collection because Lehman and Rockefeller were often, you know, they were going head to head and they had similar works. So I was saying, look at the quality of this collection. This is museum quality. It was really an interesting um, sort of in, way for me to sort of see an inside of the auction house, uh, which I find impressive. Now you are deputy director which um, in is your field, do you stay within American or do you venture out a little bit or? Yeah, I, 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 I know you're also- My, my, my passion is certainly, you know, my, my expertise has been um, 40 years of American art, but you do reach a point in your life where you realize that um, there are um, many opportunities that come along in your if you if you stick with it long enough, and so my day uh, might be visiting uh, something in my field, um, mm -hmm. which is my, my favorite furniture is Newport furniture oh, nice. uh, from the 18th century, and that's a long story. Um, it's the most cosmopolitan. I think of the colonial port cities and the furniture that, that the cabinet makers there is amazing, but um, it also could be that. Um, uh, I'm, I work with the old master painting department. Uh, uh, I work with the Asian art departments. I work uh, pretty much with every department that wants to have me along right. because the questions that come up from 
collectors and uh, professionals in the field um, don't always require a great expertise in, in the art itself. So right. uh, it, it, I cannot tell the difference between a Ming vase and a vase that would be, um, you know, down at McArdle's or, or something. It's, 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 kind of, it's kind of difficult. I'm like, oh, I don't know. But, but I do know something about, and if you're connected to McArdle's, I don't mean that as a, as a criticism, but, but uh, I, it, if you spend time in the art world, you quickly realize that your, your expertise is usually fairly narrow to be an authority in the marketplace. Um, it's it's hard to do that um, um, unless it's contemporary art, and that's a little little joke about contemporary art. If if it's still being painted today, and that that is the big driver engine of the art market today, it's art that is contemporary. Right. And I think it's important to remember that at one point all art was contemporary when it was being made. So if it was Egyptian art, it was contemporary when they were making it because they were making it. And in, in the 18th century in America, it was contemporary and cutting edge and, and, and fashionable. And so those markets become classic markets uh, as we move into the future. So believe it or not, artists like um, Andy Warhol today is considered kind of a classic right. uh, art. He's uh, we, we know the nature of the material and, and, and his 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 works of art, but the joke at Christie's right now is, if you want to really know what the cutting edge of art is, you have to ask the interns who are sitting, um, you know, in the in, yeah. in your office. They know the names of the artists, and and the person who might be running the contemporary department is like, I've never heard of that artist before. Right. So, okay. yeah. so the art from the '60s is really um, now solidly in um, the vernacular of of classic. Right. So there's no magic. So for many years at the Met, the Maginot line was the Armory Show, right. 1913. Anything before that time stays in the American wing. Anything after that went to modern and contemporary. That's still kind of in place, but we're finding more and more artists from the 20s and 30s creeping into the American wing. And now, of course, the Met's trying to expand their contemporary galleries. So I find that these lines seem to be blurred, not only in terms of time, but also who is American. And that was going to be a question I wanted to ask you because... I find particularly when I'm teaching American art and, you know, we've had so many shows at the Met that have grappled with this. How do you define it? Or maybe you don't. Well, so that is the, the buzz word question right now about, about where these lines are drawn. And I, because I knew the subject that we would be talking a little bit about, I thought it would be helpful to just put three examples uh, together um, and let's just go with what, what happened this year of the moment. And that's um, Ernie Barnes, uh, The Sugar Shack. Mm -hmm. um, so is everybody here familiar with Ernie Barnes? So, so I happen to know who he was because he did the cover album, uh, uh, The Sugar Shack was the... Uh, um, the the cover of Marvin Gaye's uh, first album. So I, I want to make it absolutely clear that, that um, I am not in the position to talk about Ernie Barnes's art in, in any way except to, to say I admire his handling of paint and his individuality in, in producing, which you see down here. The Sugar Shack um, is um, a, a scene depicting a dance hall in a barn or something that, um, that he depicted. Ernie Barnes was a professional football player. And in 1959, he was uh, recruited by the Washington uh, Redskins. And I use that name because that's what the team was called at the time. And when the owners discovered that he was a black man, they rescinded his contract 
And that was 1959, if you can believe this. And it's to show you how, how, how the country was, was moving at that time. He got a contract and he played professional football and then he became an, uh, and he, he was criticized because he was always drawing football players on his sketch pad, you know, and getting in trouble for it, for, for his art. And then he started creating these works. Well, the Sugar Shack was just sold in our contemporary sale. The estimate was a hundred to $150,000 and it sold for $15 million. And I think if you wanna know what the, what's happening to me, that was indicative of the, the emotional uh, you know, pull that it's one thread of what's happening in the art world today, which is that's a discovery. That's something that, that, that and, and the word opportunism kind of springs to my mind because everyone said, oh my God, well, was it the album cover? What, what, why did that happen? Um, and uh, I, I wrote down um, Bill Perkins, who's a hedge fund and poker player, bought, bought the uh, uh, work. Christie's was approached by about 20 people who had Eddie Barnes works of art and we are selling things privately which is a whole nother right, subject yeah. so it's not just auction but it's private sale and none of those works have sold since this so it's it's finding your way with a new artist it's discovering somebody who was not recognized right which and, is which which is my question to you because and again this is not my expertise people always say like so when you're in the Met, what does this cost? I say it costs nothing because it's not for sale and I don't have to go there. But when you have an Eddie, a, a, a Ernie Barnes, and I have to confess, I didn't know who he was when I saw your slide and I looked him up. Um, how do you come up with an estimate? How, how do you do that? And, and then how do the values, how, how does that settle into a business model? I mean, that, that to me is, is I, I, I've always never really understood that. So it's very difficult with the contemporary department, the, the most cutting edge to have an answer. And it would be a total lie if um, um, I told you that we, that, that we anticipate, anticipated that. We, we have sometimes a gut feeling. Um, the NFT market, which many of you have been reading about the non-fungible token market is a perfect example yeah, right. of, uh, so last year, those of you that followed this at all um, know that the contemporary department at Christie's put an NFT uh, into the contemporary sale, non-fungible token. It's basically digital art. We'll, we'll, we don't have to do, do the deep dive in NFTs. Mike Winkleman created 5,000 images um, of digital art. And we put it in the contemporary sale a young 25 year old uh, woman in the contemporary department came to her boss and said, I just got a phone call from this group that wants to sell an NFT. I promise everybody in this room, nobody at Christie's except for maybe one had ever heard of an NFT. And that's the honest truth. And the head of her contemporary division said, well, we'll, we'll put it in the online sale, meaning not the evening sale, and we'll just try it as an experiment. Fast forward, um, the night before the online sale closed, I had dinner with a, a client and the bidding had gone up to $15 million. And we were all uh, in a restaurant in New York and we were all in shock. Can you believe this? this what is this digital art? What's an NFT? What's cryptocurrency, which, you know, it's all. Yeah. Please and, don't ask that was in your question. <laughs> in the morning, at nine o'clock in the morning, when the sale closed, the painting had gone up to $70 million. It had our attention. <laughs> and non-fungible tokens out of the blue. So we are experimenting in the contemporary sale with one or two lots at the end of the sale with things that um, 
are are experimental. Right. And NFTs. Uh, this is not a lecture about NFTs, <laughs> but it is. It is on every it, It's a. It's digital art has had its a, a moment. It's calmed down quite a bit, and we could talk about that if there are yeah. questions. Um, I'll point out the uh, one other picture right now: the Emanuel Leutze, Washington, George Washington crossing the Delaware. We put that into the contemporary sale as well, um, which is the evening contemporary sale. Emanuel Leutze painted this picture, and many of you will recognize or remember the large version, which at the Met, is at the Metropolitan Museum. This is a smaller version; it's about. 50 inches high and maybe 60 inches wide. It's another version that he painted in 1851. Mm -hmm. So 70 years after George Washington actually crossed the Delaware. That would be like us painting today, you know, the, the, the Normandy invasion and doing a version of, of that. that. That's the space of time that we're talking about. Anyway, nostalgia, the continued interest that Americans have in their own history and some other factors led to that picture being sold for $45 million. Which, which surprised me when I saw that, <clears throat> because one of the things, uh, I'm an Americanist, and when I entered the field a while ago, um, people didn't care that much about American art. You know, the hot stuff at Columbia was modern contemporary. It was the Renaissance. And people didn't really, you know, Barbara Novak, she was my professor. She was, people didn't really kind of, we think they all said it was sort of very sentimental, quite frankly. And I will argue in the last, since I've been in that field, it has exploded and it has become very politicized and it has become a very contested field. And I would argue it's gone from being the kind of quiet little brother to being, you know, the the the, the elephant in the room. I mean, there's always something about almost every work of American art that people can address given the concerns of the world today. And I'm wondering, did the sale of that was that impacted by that change in any way or? So this is a, 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 a big moment, I think, with Amer America's fascination, continued fascination of being American. And I think for me, I, I'm, I called uh, an old collector friend of mine and I asked him what his reaction to this was. And, Page, he kind of picked up a little bit on what you were saying, which was, if you can believe it, that large picture by Emanuel Leutze, so American painting in Germany in the 1850s with a, with a studio, Eastman Johnson and others, the Metropolitan was considering deaccessioning. Oh, yeah. oh, yeah. It was considered kind of a dog for this, a long time. This picture, and came that close to deaccessioning it. Now, if you walk into the American wing at the Met, I, I did this because I... Fast forward, I, I've been asked to speak about this picture in and the history of this in, in Florida this mm -hmm. January. And I thought, well, this is interesting. I'm going to go to the Met. I'm going to sit on one of the benches there. I'm just going to watch people look at the picture. And I know you've done this, um, you know, as, as a professional, you know, at the museum. But it it's amazing to see people's reaction to the picture just young kids, you know, there's a very, you know, patriotic kind of feel to it. It comes out of the tradition of 19th century, you know, large scale, you know, pictures, everything about this picture, not everything, but many things about this picture are wrong. There was no stars and stripes uh, right, when, yeah. when Washington was crossing the Delaware. Mm -hmm. it, it, that wasn't invented until later. So that's, that's fiction. Um, the, the uh, Washington would never have been standing in the, in the boat like that. Um, the the truth and fiction about that moment is astoundingly uh, hyped up right. here. And Emanuel Leutze was using this picture for his own um, uh, personal gain, personal to gain, a history painter, and, and his own his own uh, feeling of you know his position on uh, at, he he wanted to uh, abolish slavery. He was 
it was it was achieving other goals. Mm -hmm. However, there are a lot of things that are right about it. And of course, Washington's crossing the Delaware, as you all have read uh, in David McCullough and, and, and many other uh, books, that is the lucky, luckiest moment, the turning point mm -hmm. of not only the revolution, but the turning point, I think, of uh, the creation of America. And at that point going forward, the apotheosis of Washington begins as he as he uh, was the person who made the decision to attack Trenton. It wasn't his idea. Uh, it was one of his other generals who had the idea to do it. There were three groups that tried to cross the Delaware that uh, Christmas morning. Two of them couldn't make it. Um, this myth that the Hessian soldiers who were guarding Trenton were somehow drunk from their Christmas, you know, party, uh, Eve party, totally false. They were one of the most highly trained, efficient uh, armies in the world. Um, these mercenaries were, were, were there. It just happened that the wind was blowing from Trenton. They did not hear the Americans uh, as they crossed over. And I could go on and on and on about the myths, but this, this picture um, has become lore, right? And it went to. Uh, it was competed for not just by American history buyers, by by a new generation of collectors that have entered the market today that are buying at the top of the market in all categories. Mm -hmm. And that amount of money is um, kind of a bargain compared to Mr. Basquiat. Right. Well, it was interesting because the Met has been grappling with a lot of these issues of race and gender and ethnicity, um, Native Americans claims. We had the Ken Monkman series, which were enormous history paintings that were in dialogue. In fact, Ken Monkman, we were talking about the apotheosis of George Washington, which of late is a little bit tricky. Um, Ken Monkman makes chief m mischief. It, it's a long story, but in any case, he does a revisionist history of the most iconic painting at the Met, not necessarily the best painting, but the most iconic painting with a sort of a rethinking about who's in that boat and why they're in that boat. And I was just very curious to wonder if any of those kinds of responses drive the price of this, or if these are just people that say, hey, it's, it's a great value for $45 million. I mean, compared to the Basquiat for 110 uh, per square inch, I don't know. But uh, so I, I like I like the fact that you put up the Basquiat because I, I teach Basquiat and my students are all obsessed with Basquiat. Basquiat is kind of the new Andy Warhol in Colombia in the core. Um, and of course, enormous prices at auction. But at this point, when you see a Basquiat coming, how, how do you respond to that? Do you, do you say, okay, we're going to have another record-breaking moment or are, are people kind of moving on from Basquiat or has Basquiat still got this staying power? Basquiat still has it big time. Um, let me tell you two quick, quick things about Basquiat. First, uh, I met him in 1985. Um, he hung out with Andy Warhol and many people may not know Andy Warhol collected American furniture, which is oh, yes, where right. I was. So, so they used to come into the sales at Christie's and, you know, we, Basquiat was kind of a graffiti artist and a little bit like dodgy downtown, the, you know, the Warhol scene and, and all of that. But we sold this Basquiat in, I wrote this then 1984 for $19,000. Now we fast forward, it actually came up at Sotheby's, uh, $110 million. So, so right there, we have to say why. And um, I, I, since I brought the slide, um, I wanted to make sure I had it absolutely right. It was bought by a Japanese uh, collector named Marzawa. He's uh, a 46 years old. His net worth is $1.6 billion. And he was interviewed after that sale. And they said, why did you do that? And he said, and I think this is, I don't know who, who, who was in New York in the 1980s. He said he had missed 
that gritty graffiti driven New York. Oh. And he, it's, it was a nostalgia purchase. He felt he was, um, had, had, had missed that and had romanticized that. Now, I don't know about you, I lived in New York in the 1980s. Yeah, there wasn't when, anything too romantic about it. It was pretty dirty and- uh... <laughs> when, you, when you want, and there is a, if you want to know what the cutting edge is of, of the contemporary market of this thread, um, I will tell you a one teeny little story. Um, I am an auctioneer at Christie's and I do a lot of benefit auctions for groups. And I did a benefit auction uh, in the kind of late eighties uh, uh, to celebrate uh, Earth Day. Do we still have Earth Day? I. I hope every day is Earth Day, but right. I, I don't know. I well, don't... Earth Day then, you remember everybody had their bags? Yeah, Earth right, Day, right, Earth right. Day. And, and uh, it was in one of those huge lofts downtown in Soho. And um, they had gotten various people downtown to donate works of art. And one of the works that was donated was by a gang leader named Ramel Z. Oh, sure, yeah. He's in, in Hollywood Africans. He's very hot. Well, yeah. I bring it up for this reason, Paige. I knew you would know. In 1980, let's say it was about eight, he was not so hot because he created works of art in plaster reliefs. And I, uh, uh, he is a, a former gang leader, um, passed away. Right, now, yeah. But um, he was a very intimidating guy. And of course the work didn't sell uh, in the benefit auction. And uh, I will, I will elect to, to be a little off color here because I'm just going to quote him. Uh, I saw him at the bar after it and I was like, hey man, I um, I love your work. I don't know why I didn't sell. You know, we we're like loading up our place and it's just like chains, rings, and he's like, oh my God. And uh, he he's said- a very uh, intimidating looking No guy. question. He said, oh, yeah. he goes, it's okay, man. They asked me to donate this for uh, international, uh, Peace and Earth Day. And he goes, and I'm for peace, unless someone fucks with me. No. And I was like, got it. Last year, two years ago, the New Yorker. Yeah, they had a they had a whole ran profile Peter, on the children. Yeah, 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 yeah. Wrote a whole profile on Ramel Z. My point is, these this is a this is a space that I think institutions are put it right back to you, Paige, museums had ignored, neglected, uh, were, not, were not embracing. That is not the case today. And one of the big drivers in the art market today is what every museum director I know has said to their curators, do not come to me with a classic you know, work of art, come to me th that has been in the, the traditional space. Come to me with something that we have ignored. Yeah. And we have now seen that community of outsider artists, um, people of color, Native Americans, women less so, but at the forefront. Right. And, and that is what is driving the market. And I'm going to interrupt John and tell you that I have a lot of friends who have told me that you single-handedly created outsider art market at Christie's and that it really was your baby and that very forward thinking and that people give you a tremendous amount of credit for having the kind of really the courage to go there because that is, there is no scholarship. There's not a lot of, you know, those are choices that are made purely on your own eye and your own taste. Well, I, I, I have to give recognition to, to two people on this. For those in the audience here who may not be familiar with outsider art, just to define it for a second, again, um, people, artists who were not in the mainstream to begin with, meaning they may have been disenfranchised, um, they may have uh, Edmondson, uh, William Edmondson, a, a, a gravestone carver uh, in Nashville, Tennessee, started making sculptures. Um, he was not in the canon of 
uh, American sculptors. Um, Bill Trailer, um, a uh, uh, born into slavery, started creating uh, his drawings um, on, on the street. Uh, artists who were in uh, psychiatric uh, uh, wards mm -hmm. who were creating art. Um, um, I happen to think Joseph Cornell is that's really yeah, that's, is that's an right. outsider yeah. artist because yeah, he, he was a shut in living uh, yeah, up, untrained, living with his mom. Yeah, building yeah. these fantastic boxes. boxes. So that's outsider art. However, the truth is, is that when there's an opening at Christie's for someone to join, um, you often will say, "Well, you need a you know a silver specialist, or you'll need a you know um, a temporary art specialist." In that process, we met a woman named Cara Zimmerman who had been, um, I, I know her story very well. And she, she was a uh, art history major at Harvard. She wrote her thesis on fairy tales, got into the Princeton PhD art history program, good. turned it down oh. and went to the University of Delaware to study outsider art. And just because I sort of like to go against the grain a little bit, I just was so fascinated. And we did sell outsider art but we didn't really fully appreciate um, what it would be to have as this platform, a scholar migrating over to the commercial world who really, really understood this form. And we, we just basically, all she needed was somebody to give her a chance to, to, to do her thing. And she has created at Christie's the best platform in my opinion, for uh, these outside artists. So full, full, full um, uh, recognition of how lucky it is that you have when you hire somebody who is um, as talented as Cara. I'll take credit mm -hmm. for hiring her, but not, not, I would never go one for one with her, uh, on, uh, a, a real pro. And we 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 are so lucky to have her. Now we want to save some time for your questions, but I do have one last question for you. So take yourself back to Greenwich in 1983, but it's 2023. So you're a you're a 20 year old guy. I'll give it a year or two. Um, you want to go into this business? What would you do now? Would you go to Christie's or would you? go get your PhD or would you go hang out downtown or would you go, but what would you do? How would you approach it? And, and what, what might you give advice to people who want to enter the field in today's world? Cause I think it's a lot harder. I don't think the path is anywhere near as clear as it was 40 years ago. There isn't, there isn't really one path into the art world. There are many and the luck that you might have in working with a group of people who take you under their wing, that is the secret. Because I think people who, who um, like, and I, as I said at the beginning, I, I was 23 years old and I, I wanted to be, you know, at the, you know, the cutting edge of everything. Yeah. And um, it's astonishing how long it takes to become an authority in the marketplace. And I think, I think that if I was in Greenwich at that time, um, I, uh, I happened to be in a family that, that loved art. My brother uh, was a photographer and uh, I remember uh, he had an art opening at the, the, the YWCA, you know, here in Greenwich. Oh, right. And uh, you, 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 my twin sister, uh, is a photographer. And uh, my parents were, it's hard to imagine back in 1983, but if you told people at a cocktail party in Greenwich that you were going into the art world, they were like, ooh. <laughs> and I remember being at Exeter and David Von Figlio was on my floor and his father was a dentist. And we went to Revere Beach and uh, I told his father that I was an art history major at, at Exeter. And Dr. Bonfiglio looked at me like I had two heads. <laughs> and it was a different time, pre-antiques roadshow. Pre people, it was, it was not really accepted as, as kind of a mainstream profession. Right, yeah. And if you were a, 
a, a scholar as Paige is, well, that just meant that you had a, you worked in a library with a lot of dusty old books and maybe, you know, it was I, Herman Woke, I remember writes mm -hmm. about, you know, th this. <laughs> and I, new ball game, it is probably harder today because it is, it is a very hot field to go into. Very hot and field. And there to go are, into, yeah. um, my sales of American art in 1983 uh, were, Six million dollars, I think. Oh. The contemporary art department was nine million dollars. Oh That's how God. close it was. The contemporary art department today is going to be around three billion dollars, right. and yeah. uh, unfortunately, we're kind of still down by those other numbers, maybe forty or fifty, sixty million dollars in American. Uh, I decided not to ask the question on brown furniture. <laughs> Um, but I, I so so um, I think it's it's fascinating to hear you, and I think what it lets us all realize is that there really is no path in life, and you have to kind of be open to what's available to you, grab it, and go with it. And you certainly, I think, you know, have ridden an amazing wave over your last forty years. So it's really a pleasure to speak with you. Um, I think we'll try to open it up to the audience. Oh, and I, the first question is that of my illustrious husband, who also uh, went to school with John. Yeah. We're uh, really you, dating ourselves here. So you talk about um, outsider art, but I mean, for for a long time, you know, there have been Gauguin and Matisse and Picasso and all these guys who are kind of cutting the edge at that time, doing different things than people were kind of expecting, kind of going over the edge and is is it any different this time or 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 is it kind of the same that we've been going through for the last hundred years? So supply and demand is certainly a very big issue in, in any market. And the Van Goghs are kind of a little thin uh, out there in terms of availability. We did have three Van Goghs uh, in a sale last fall, which was a remarkable occurrence and they did extraordinarily well. So when artists who have been proven uh, to be uh, from a commercial point of view, successful, it, when they come up, they're hotly you know, competed for. Um, but as I said before, everything was contemporary, as you know, and, and as you're indicating, John, from, from when they were being made, they were the cutting edge of fashion. Today, what is different really is that um, the, the time that it takes to become an expert in whether it's Van Gogh or whether it's Newport Brown furniture, which I, you know, <laughs> I love so much that I, 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 I will just, I will tell, I wasn't going to say this, but we just set a record for American furniture. Oh, thank God. Pri <laughs> uh, I'm so happy uh, to hear that because we have some lovely brown furniture in our house that we've been told is is it, no longer. It, uh, it is. It the pendulum does swing back, but um, we sold two pieces of Newport furniture privately for. Um, uh, you know, it is interesting when you ask. Uh, I'm going to come back to John's question, but basically, the if something brings 110 million dollars, you have an instant platform in which to have a discussion because people want to know 110 million, 70 million for, for an NFT. You all saw it. it made the front page of the Wall Street Journal. It's simply that the platform of, of cost is, is legitimizes or at least brings people to the, to the, to the table. And in my world, the, the opportunity in contemporary art, uh, the scramble, let's, let's call it that, what basically happens is opportunistic buyers will be bidding in the day sales for contemporary art because they're all hoping to get the next hit, Basquiat yeah. before Basquiat is Basquiat. So then you, you have a platform now, Basquiat is an old master by now. And so his life and the meaning of his life and the legitimacy of, of you know, who he was and the attraction that he has to a global audience is, is huge. Yeah, we teach him at Columbia. He's in the core curriculum. I he, mean, if he, that doesn't sort of validate that comment, nothing else does. I mean, we're, we're it, treating him with Rembrandt and Michelangelo. So, yeah. so, so when, you use, when you use any pop visual culture and you, you, you're, you're, you're embedded in that, 
what is happening now though? So today it's the opportunistic buyer who says, you know what? They want to buy something for $19,000 and turn it in. Uh, by the way, Batskiat was 22 years old when he painted this picture. They want to turn that into 110 man. So there is a strong force in the art market today of opportunism. And that does not happen in the American furniture market. <laughs> I, I, I rarely have gotten anywhere on a date by saying, do you want to come over and see my Chippendale table? But opportunism and the opportunity to transform a $19,000, what people would, what were they saying about Basquiat then? And actually, legitimately, that was tapping into the Ramel Z mm -hmm. and to the markets that, I mean, I feel so dumb. Uh, Ramel Z and I were at the bar together. Mm -hmm. I should have said, hey man, I'm gonna buy it. Yeah, It was at a benefit auction. I was at Sproni Westwater Fisher in 1982 and I had an opportunity to buy those postcards. I think they were 50 cents a pop. And I was like, I didn't wanna kill myself. Who else has been <laughs> left out? That of the canon, and that's what people are scrambling for. And so, for me, the the great thing about Christie's, and 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 I have had many colleagues, you know, leave and go out on their own. But for me, um, I don't even consider it work. I, I consider every day going in. I'm so anxious to get in there to see what's happening. That that it, it's been a, a forty year, you know, you know, journey. And I, I, I hope it, it continues, as, as, uh, and it seems to be. And so we'll be selling Paul Allen's collection that starts in the Renaissance and, and with Botticelli and goes to Warhol. Um, but come to the day sales and look, and we hear people say, oh my God, that's awful. Oh my God, I could do that. Oh, that's ridiculous. And then that that's where the action is though that's what people are saying what is that you try it you try to make something that goes into that so john are those day sales being driven by collectors or are they artists because i've i've heard that artists are now coming directly to christie's and that you're working directly with artists or is that kind of the rare moment that's not the artists are rare moments because we are we are the secondary market we are not right. the commercial downtown market and then all of a sudden we are, in fact, uh, dealing. We're selling things privately, and and there are exceptions now where we are dealing directly with artists. But really, that's the bastion of the of the dealer right. pace gallery. So that still that wall hasn't been broken yet. It, still... it, there, there are cracks in it, and we we tiptoe around. I I was so flattered. One more comment about outsider art. We we sold uh, we're selling a collection of Bill trailers um, and um, Gagosian sent their gallery people to our client, which we had an agreement with, to try to get trailers into their space. And it shows you once again the material that that has been ignored. That is a very legitimate and serious omission by museums right. uh, and the, 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 the capital market, the, the markets themselves. And there's a huge fight over right. who's you know, gonna now go who's going to represent right. those artists. Um, and I think Ernie Barnes was more of an emotional purchase because of the Motown record cover and other things, but who knows? But, but it's the $19,000 purchase in 84 mm -hmm. to 110, that is just making the day sales frothy and exciting. Yeah, yeah. Maybe another question? Hi, good evening. Uh, I just have actually a twofold question. First question is, does Christie's competitor Sotheby's solicit their clients or the clients solicit you? That sounds kind of, dangerous the the, <laughs> the 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 solicitation the dance the dance is 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 a is a uh, duet um and i would say trust 
is the most important thing uh, because there are a lot of pitfalls uh, out there in the world, both, you know, um, that we could talk a great deal about, but, but there are, there is a division and I'll just tell you where I, where I am on this. I am an art specialist. Um, I, my, my closest friends at Christie's, um, there are many people who are authorities in the marketplace and I just respect them. And I, I find it, you know, intriguing and I love spending my time with them. There's also a community of, of lawyers and bankers and officers and, and restitution uh, uh, specialists. There's a whole field there. So you see that many people are working with clients as buyers over a long period of time. And one day they'll be sellers, dead or alive, you know? It, it, and so it's that dance, I would say that when people feel very comfortable, I think it's like going to a doctor. Um, if you have a good doctor, you don't need to get a, even a second opinion because that that doctor is getting second opinions from people all the time. And people do pick their auction houses, Sotheby's and Christie's. Then there's a community of people that say, I'm a trust and estates lawyer. It's imperative to go to Christie's and Sotheby's and have a bake off to decide who should sell, <laughs> you know, this picture or this collection. And I would just say, I'm sorry to be so opinionated about this. It's sometimes a mistake to have two large auction houses competing for a piece of property. If you are knowledgeable in the field, then you, you can make a decision ahead of time. It doesn't always help to have a bake off and then to have a huge uh, auction house not be representing you or your family, because that can sometimes hurt the sale uh, for obvious reasons uh, in, in the marketplace. So it's it's a it's a convoluted answer, but I'm just saying the duet can be a, a happy marriage right from the beginning, and uh, the relationships you build with with those collectors and families are are, are for a lifetime. And I I will tell you because he's not going to say it. He has fabulous relationships with families that go back a long way, and they trust you, and they. Well, I try not to blow it, but that, but, the, <laughs> the, the, but but there are inexperienced i'll say or people who feel that they're not doing their due diligence unless they it's like going to two doctors and by the end of it you're saying oh my god honey we just had all these tests at this hospital and now we've gone to this hospital what are you know it's it, it it's a complicated question but but the 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 seller of property sometimes does they they may not know anything about the art because the collector died and the relationship may have gone with that collector. So you may have children who have no experience in the field. They may have been included in the collecting with their parents. I'm, I'm using a family as an example. And so they're starting at ground zero. And I think, I think that that can sometimes um, make it a complicated uh, business transaction because they're just getting too much information. Do those people actually then excel those things or do they just put them back in their house and put it on their wall and say, guess what he said? So the question for those of you that may not have heard it is when uh, during the Antiques Roadshow, if you uh, have a guest on with you um, and there's a great discovery, um, do you sell that piece? Um, the ground rules for the Roadshow are that you may not have a commercial transaction uh, demonstration going on um, with your guests. However, <laughs> the conversations usually go like this. That was very exciting. You didn't know that this uh, was worth, you know, a uh, million dollars or a hundred thousand dollars. And um, I sure would love to see that on, uh, you know, there's a little mark here on the bottom and I should research that. Call me on Monday <laughs> and we'll see what that what that is. I've seen it all. Um, there are many people who take their piece home and they live with it and it, it's very important. There are people who are so happy to, to um, sell it. I have rarely, maybe only once, seen the specialist who was with that guest not be selected to sell it 
in their oh. in their auction house. Mm -hmm. But once in a maybe once in a while, um, it gets off the rails. But and I, I think we have time for one more question right here. What percentage of Christie's sales all the way in the back? Hi. Oh. <laughs> what percentage of Christie's sales are private? And how do you all determine whether to take something the private route or another way? So I'll give a fast answer because maybe we can take even another one. The the sales of Christie's were uh eight billion dollars last year. 1.7 billion dollars were private sales. So that gives you the 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 uh the level and the decision is a very long answer, which we won't go to why private versus public. And and there are very good reasons for both. Sometimes privacy is one, and sometimes um uh placement of a piece can be uh did, you know, COVID, did COVID have any impact on that? COVID has did not on private sales, COVID had a huge impact on the platform itself that is people bidding at home on their laptops we had to pivot very hard to that platform because in-person auctions which is a, up until covid was the, the best way to go going forward it's going to be a hybrid mm -hmm. live sale people in the audience and now people on their laptops as well right. and that technology had not reached the point that it has today which is like a movie production so yeah. we have we have we're embracing the world on the internet right but it's much more exciting to be in the room if you ask so your right. job as auctioneer is still secure yes good i know there was one right here and i know you wanted to ask we're happy to answer your questions if i, I know we're we're kind of went a little over i have we have a tendency i have a tendency to do that so it's my fault again <laughs> Sure. I, I think just to summarize it, um, the the works of art that uh, are bringing these tremendous sums of money like a basquiat um there, there is a big gap between uh, those people who who cannot afford such a thing really and those that that small group of people that do that do uh that that are in that space but well i think that is a very important question and the the reason is is that that mocking or or whatever word you want to use of a community of people um that community loves it they 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 are surprisingly uh, resilient about what what where they come from and i i know some of these collectors and the more uh critical the better sometimes and i so i don't think they mind mm -hmm. uh, and I, I will also say basquiat didn't mind making money either and he was pretty upfront about that he said you know i'll take the highest bidder so he he, he was not an anti-capitalist in his own way I mean, he's certainly speaking out against um, a lot of issues of blacks and black men. He, of course, also represents the um, African Carib. You know, his mother is Puerto Rican, father is from Haiti. So he brings together a lot of cultural issues. Um, and yet when he was, before he passed away in 87, he was making a lot of money and he was on the cover of every, you know, and and, and so he, he had no problem with that. And neither did his father, who I met, yeah. <laughs> who, who would come into Christie's and he was his business, uh, uh, you know, agent. And neither of his sisters, now that they've opened that museum downtown, it's raking in money, $40 yeah. a ticket. Yes. Yeah. I know there's one right in the middle. Yes, sir. So we've heard so much about Basquiat. I'm wondering if we could hear your comments about, that's sort of why 
uh, it got so much money, but what the artist was trying to do here, if, if, if you would like to comment on that, either of you or both of you. Paige, you should say that. <laughs> well, like, as I said, we teach Bosquet, and basically what he's commenting, and, and there's a lot to say, and this is the joy of Bosquet, but you'll notice, as you said, there's a Bosquet mask, mask, which I love the term that you use, because if you think back to the beginning of the 20th century, who was using masks? Picasso was using masks, right? And Picasso basically starts to create a phenomenon around the use of the African mask. Is Picasso have any connection with African? None whatsoever. So basically what Basquiat is claiming is, this is my cultural emblem. So I'm gonna claim it and I'm gonna be kind of in your face to the art world that has celebrated the use of African masks on the part of Picasso. That's one element. Another interesting biographical element is Basquiat when he's a very young boy, age eight or nine, is run over by a car. And he spends a very long period of time in bed convalescing and his mother gives him Gray's anatomy. And he is very well versed in the skull. And you can see he's very well versed in the anatomy of the skull. So there's an autobiographical element. And of course, one of the things that you'll see, he crosses things out, you know, the X's and the O's, everything. If, if you're really interested in Bosquet, you have to read um, the Thompson, Master T. He was the great um, scholar at Yale. Um, but Bosquet wants to sort of call your attention by crossing things out. He wants to, as, as kind of what John was saying, he wants to attack the very people who are going to buy these kind of things. But I, I would argue that, you know, also the colors are fantastic. Not that your slide isn't great, but when you see this in person, it blows your mind. It's an absolute killer. I mean, it, it, there's, they're, they're incredibly powerful, these Boston. That's my phone ringing. <laughs> and just... But just I'm one more question. Oh, no. <laughs> Last question over but here. You, John, wait, you want to add to that because I, I, no, I, I, I answered should, that. We'll do one more question. Okay, and... <laughs> hey, so I'm just thinking up there in New Haven, do you think that, um, thinking about the writers too, you've got the Iowa Writers Workshop. You're going through the system. You went to the good schools. Um, artists now uh, get your master's uh, in fine arts up in New Haven, a few other places. But I, I've been sitting here for an hour and I'm looking at the Bosquiat and the Ernie Barnes who's the football player and he's doodling. Um, do you think that it would use the word outsider it's just this raw energy and power that they have that you're never going to get by the time uh the system has got th gotten through with you teaching you how to do art there, it's 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 a uh it'll be neat it'll be beautiful it'll be as exquisite some of the some of the uh some of the portraits now that i see they're exquisite in the coloration and the graphic quality and all of that yet yet the barns and the bosquiat they're just the energy and the strength of the power. Can you speak to that? Well, in a nutshell, I would say that I ask that question every morning and I go to a show or I go to an exhibit and I say to myself, oh my God, why didn't I think of that? What, what an amazing thing. So I am very optimistic and I'm not saying that's a pessimistic question. I, I think you're, we're saying the same thing. I believe you asked the beginning page about what it means to be American, American art. And I'll just say the color field painters that came, that they weren't Americans, they came from Europe. So Rothko, and you get on the list of these, mm -hmm. these people who fled Europe and they, they had these opportunities to these huge canvases, they were free and they got to do whatever they wanted to do. And today, Basquiat, only in America, not to beat the drum here, everybody, but only in America at, at, the, at that time did people have the chance to, to, to express themselves. And so here, my outlook, why Washington? Um, we're seeing war in the Ukraine. We're seeing refugees. We're going to see powerful images come out of this. And I am so excited about what, what's in the future for contemporary art. And then my own field, the nostalgia and the importance of, of symbols of, of our country 
uh, as seen, even though it's full of myth, uh, Washington himself. And if you haven't got it by now, Washington is the main man. I, 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 I love that history. And in my slide that I'm preparing for my talk in Florida, guess how many works, written works, books, articles oh, uh, are imagine. done on George Washington every year? I bet it's thousands, right? 9,000 last year. And so if you go to 1952 and they started recording it, it's hundreds of thousands on Washington. He will sublimate uh, 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 all of the other downside of, you know, the criticism of founding fathers. I, I'm, I'm, I will just say last comment on the art world is it, every day gets more exciting. And I think that energy that you're talking about, you see here, there's much more coming. So come to the day sale and see, see what's there and, and uh, spend a little bit of money and maybe it'll jump into the, the big Maybe range. you'll get that boss. Yeah. <laughs> maybe you'll be up here when we're doing this. <laughs> That's what, exactly. All right. Well, we've been talking too long. Thank you so much. Thank you Sean. very much. So honored to have you here and thank you all for a wonderful conversation. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>